So I'm going to get started. My name is Kenton Zavitz. I'm uh, the Director of Clinical Affairs for uh, Cambridge Cognition. Um, I have about 16 years of uh, being in the uh, drug development industry in uh, small companies. And what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is um, something I think has been under the radar screen for a lot of people um, in our industry, yet it's something that I think we all have personal experience and personal concerns about. Um, and that is uh, our, our cognitive safety. Uh, just wanted to put my disclosures up really quickly. I'm an employee of Cambridge Cognition, and at Cambridge Cognition, we provide cognitive assessment uh, products and services to many organizations, both in academia as well as uh, some of the companies, or all these companies and more that uh, are up here. Um, so this is an outline of my presentation. I'll let you sort of read over what we're going to be covering. Um, but suffice to say that I think when you talk to people on the street, if you talk to patients, um, and you ask them, what is the disease that you most fear uh, you know, getting from a personal point of view? And most often, what comes up is Alzheimer's disease. And the reason for that is, obviously, it's affecting something that is so dear to our uh, sort of personal life, our memories, our ability to function in everyday life, our interactions with our family, our ability to uh, have a job, get an education. Um, and so this is something that everyone is very aware of. Another example is look at the popularity of brain training apps and games that, uh, such as Lumosity. I won't ask for a show of hands to, to suggest how many people have experienced that, but it's a very popular thing. Again, cognition is something that in our everyday lives and in our personal interactions is on top of mind. And yet, outside in the drug development industry, outside of those of us who are developing drugs to treat CNS disorders, it's something that we don't often think about, nor do we routinely uh, use objective uh, assessments for as part of a standard drug safety profile. So I think this is starting to change, and we have a lot of clients who are now beginning to be more interested in profiling their drugs from a point of view of cognitive safety. Uh, but I think this is something that is going to be, if it's not something that's an, on top of mind for you, uh, hopefully in the uh, years to come, it will become more and more of uh, an issue that is um, given its, its just amount of attention. So first of all, what is cognition? Um, very simply, I think it's something that we're all somewhat familiar with. It's the ability to perceive and react, uh, to process and understand information, to store and retrieve that in memory, um, and then higher order to use executive function to be able to make decisions and uh, uh, produce the appropriate responses. So clearly, as I mentioned before, it's, it's critical to day-to-day -day life um, in every aspect of what we do. So we can break this down into so, sort of cognitive functions um, that are easily and very specifically separable and measurable um, in using um, using assessment tools. So we can uh, look at psychomotor speed, we can look at attention and our ability to focus, uh, we can look at memory, short-term storage, long-term storage, and then again, higher order processing, executive function, making decisions, thinking, um, and another level on top of that is sort of social cognition and, and responding to emotional stimuli. We can further break that down into additional uh, subcategories and domains and each of these is separable and measurable with the appropriate uh, cognitive assessment um, uh, test. So these uh, neural functions and brain functions can actually be mapped uh, to physical locations in the brain and uh, specific interactions between neural systems. So for example, episodic memory is, uh, is, is um, a function that is the first uh, sort of thing that people can detect when they're developing uh, dementia. And that's due to a, a deficit in the cholinergic system um, in the hippocampus, uh, sort of in the middle of the screen area, where um, uh, that's essential for memory processing. So all of these systems interact together. They can be mapped physically to uh, these parts of the brain. And if we're doing a test that is uh, sensitive to uh, detecting these particular functions, 
we can do it and image the brain and look at blood flow in that particular region and, and see that when we're testing uh, semantic memory that the hippocampus has increased blood flow. So these are all sort of physical and uh, 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 neurochemical uh, connections that can be looked at with cognitive assessment tools. So what I, when I say cognitive assessment, what we're talking about is the objective measurement of distinct abilities um, that, we've, that I've been uh, sort of listing out there. Um, we do this because we're focused on understanding the brain, looking at the basic science of cognition. We also want to understand the diseases and disorders of cognition, dementia, depression, uh, ADHD, uh, that are manifestations of, of cognitive deficits. We also, in our drug development, when we're looking at uh, agents, new agents that we would like to use to treat these, um, we can evaluate their effect uh, in clinical trials. And as I'm going to be talking a little bit more about today, uh, we can also use these uh, tools to monitor safety of both cognitive uh, CNS uh, uh, drugs as well as other drugs that are being developed for a variety of different indications. And of course, all of this leads into uh, sort of an awareness in clinical practice of uh, cognitive health um, and uh, more and more monitoring, uh, and in the future, monitoring in real time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future uh, of the talk. So why monitor cognition during drug development? So it, it's, it's as many of our inputs into the process are, it facilitates early decision making. It can help us determine whether we want to adva advance an asset, either from the point of view of efficacy or from the point of view of safety. It can help us with dose selection. Um, in, in cognitive uh, indications, a lot of times you have an inverted U-shaped curve where a, a, a low dose uh, may have a detrimental effect, a middle dose may give you the cognitive enhancement that you're looking for, um, and a higher dose may also uh, end up, because you're putting things out of balance, into a, uh, showing a deficit. So dose selection and being able to um, perhaps in some certain cases titrate the dose is important. It can also help us uh, select the patient populations for later phase studies. So who are the appropriate people to test with this drug? Um, what kind of cognitive uh, baseline effects might suggest that somebody is going to be super sensitive to uh, this drug and either see an enhanced or a, a, a diminished effect, uh, or a, a, a patient population that may have a particular uh, neur uh, uh, neurological deficit that uh, suggests that this drug is not going to be safe to use. Uh, so more and more, we're thinking about this in terms of it being part of a Critical, uh, critical part of a drug safety portfolio as well as risk management strategy. Um, the regulators are also increasingly interested in um, objective uh, quantitative measures of uh, cognitive safety. And it's also an important uh, tool to be able to differentiate your product either from another drug in the class or one that might be a different mode of action um, that may uh, a competitive drug may have a, a cognitive side effect or a deficit that is of concern. And if you are studying uh, cognitive safety throughout your de drug development, you may uh, be able to differentiate your product or avoid class labeling that um, in cases where you don't have proof that there's no effect of, of, uh, of a cognitive signal in, in, in your particular program. Um, and finally, I think it's a, also important to think about this in terms of Many diseases have underlying cognitive uh, effects uh, that are caused by the disease. And so by treating the disease, the underlying disease process, you may actually be able to demonstrate a cognitive ben benefit um, rather than be concerned about showing cognitive uh, deficits or safety signals. So these are a list of, of uh, conditions in which cognitive impairment can occur. And, and some of these are very obvious uh, that are familiar to all of us, and especially in the CNS area, so Alzheimer's disease, depression, schizophrenia. But there's many diseases on here or uh, disease states that are probably you're not thinking of when you think of uh, uh, potential for cognitive impairment. Things like obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and so all of these 
cognitive impairments represent potential treatment targets that uh, we can both monitor and assess as we uh, develop um, new medicines. So again, coming back to sort of the more familiar area where modulations of, uh, of uh, the CNS modulators of neurotransmitter systems obviously can have an impact on, on cognition. And I already mentioned the inverted U phenomena. It's, it's also true that some drugs that are uh, developed to treat specific diseases like Alzheimer's disease, if you test them at acute or higher doses in cognitively normal people, you can induce deficits. Um, so again, dosing and the patient population is a very important consideration when looking at uh, effects on, on cognition from a safety point of view. Uh, blockers of neurotransmitters and any c compound that we know uh, or we perceive as uh, altering mood or uh, having effects on anxiety um, or sedation. So these are the familiar uh, areas where cognition is, is me measured and monitored. But in the sort of the non-CNS world of drug development, um, compounds that can affect, uh, that, uh, affect the heart, breathing, the immune system, glucose transport, cholesterol metabolism, all of these can actually have impacts on uh, on cognitive safety. Um, another thing that is, again, very familiar to those who work in the CNS area is thinking about the blood-brain barrier, trying to get your, your drug through that uh, protective um, dynamic uh, layer of cells that protects our, our brains from toxic molecules and infectious agents. It's always been a challenge to sort of get your drug into the brain to get to the target. But it's also something that we have to be aware of and conser be concerned about when we're not, when, when working outside of the CNS area. Um, so for example, the integrity and the functional permeability of the blood-brain barrier can be affected by common medical conditions. So again, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, these can actually have effects on the blood-brain barrier. Um, inflammatory conditions, diseases like multiple sclerosis, obviously, other neurodegenerative diseases can also impact uh, the blood-brain barrier, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, infections such as HIV, um, physical uh, alterations to the brain, uh, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and also certain medications can have an effect on the blood-brain barrier permeability. So uh, uh, co-administration of, 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 of medications can also affect the ability of your brain, your your drug, to uh, have perhaps unanticipated access and effect on brain function and cognition. Uh, finally, just the aging process itself. Again, many of our you know our elderly are taking multiple drugs, um, and just the the process of, of of aging changes the permeability of the blood brain barrier so something that might be tested in animal studies or early phase one looking at uh, access to the brain of a, of a of a particular drug in the population that you're interested in treating it can have a very uh, different um, uh, level of access so the Drug developers, um, as well as the regulators, are becoming more and more interested in monitoring, measuring cognition. Um, in the uh, guidance uh, document reference below from 2005, the, the uh, re regulators suggest that they recognize that some categories of AEs um, are notoriously difficult to detect, and they highlight cognitive function without special efforts, without um, objective uh, uh, instruments to measure this. And they go on to say that um, if the database includes such special studies um, with objective measurements, uh, that they should be, that those studies should be given credence over non-targeted studies that, um, so the self-reporting of AEs, which tend to substantially underestimate these kinds of, uh, of, of events. So some examples, uh, this is a recent paper um, suggesting that um, certain, again, certain patient populations may be uh, exquisitely uh, prone to uh, unintended uh, cognitive uh, side effects from uh, certain classes of drugs. So these are all anticholinergic medications used to treat, for example, uh, overactive bladder, uh, depression, uh, antihistamines for hay fever. And it suggests that the longer that 
the elderly use these drugs, the higher their risk for dementia um, may be. So is this sort of a causation? This is an observational study. Um, it may not be practical to, at this point, or ethical to be able to do a randomized controlled study to look at these broad classes of, of uh, medications. So without a database to really assess uh, whether or not dementia risk is, um, is uh, if there's a causative effect of, of the anticholinergics, we may never know. Um, but it sort of makes sense from a mechanistic point of view. Again, cholinergic deficit is the first uh, step that occurs in mild cognitive impairment that leads to dementia. So if you're giving an anticholinergic, you may be tipping the balance towards uh, a permanent state of dementia. So that's obviously something of great concern. Um, in the cardiovascular space, I think what we uh, observe is that there are many cardiovascular medications that um, are associated with neuropsychiatric consequences. But these associations haven't been tested with rigorous assessment tools. They rely on self-reported AEs. There are very few uh, trials that have been designed to examine these associations. And as I mentioned before, cognitive or neuropsychiatric syndromes are often part of the underlying uh, disease. And therefore, self-reporting and post-marketing studies may simply be a progression of the disease that's causing these kinds of symptoms. Um, so an example of this is beta blockers uh, are often associated, associated by uh, physicians with depression. And this is believed to be even more common when it's a lipophilic molecule that has uh, enhanced access to the brain. But this is actually very controversial. And when you look at uh, more recent trials that have done uh, objective cognitive assessments and meta-analysis of large uh, amounts of data, you, you, you see that the, the data don't, don't really support these long-held associations. However, as we do more clinical trials and beta blockers have now been associated with some positive cognitive benefits. So for example, they're used to trade anxiety. And in fact, uh, recent surveys in symphony orchestras have suggested that about 25% of players take a beta blocker before a concert in order to re reduce their performance anxiety. Um, so they're also being examined to see if there's a, a reduction in aggression. Uh, and a reduced risk of PTSD uh, with certain beta blockers. So there are additional uh, randomized controlled studies that are ongoing that are examining these cognitive potential benefits um, and, and may also reveal uh, whether or not um, some of the uh, associated uh, uh, cognitive risks are, are real or not. Um, recently in the, in the uh, world of, of uh, Cholesterol lowering drugs, it was in 2012, uh, a warning labeled uh, change that suggested that rare post marketing reports of cognitive impairment, memory loss, et cetera, associated with statin use. Um, and it says that these symptoms are generally not serious and uh, are reversible upon discontinuation and were uh, time to onset could be up to one day to years of taking statins. So, again, uh, that data seems pretty sketchy in terms of, and it's very controversial as to whether this is a real effect. However, there, are ha there have been some randomized controlled studies with statins in a very sensitive population, those with Alzheimer's disease, in order to see if there was potential cognitive benefit that was suggested by epidemiological studies. And in four big studies, a Cochrane review uh, that went back to look at cognitive safety found that there was no effect of these medications, positive or negative, on cognition. So again, a very sensitive population that suggests that in a randomized study, no effect uh, of, of cholesterol uh, lowering drugs. Um, again, and I know Nick uh, is going to and uh, talk uh, later on talk a lot about um, drug drug interactions. Um, this piece of data I find uh, very sort of uh, interesting and kind of scary and, and something that we're all familiar with if, if, if we're familiar with our parents' medications. Um, so 30% of patients are, are taking six or more drugs once they're over the age of 65. And that is a very you know, concerning thing. Who, how do we monitor these complex drug-drug uh, interactions? And this is just an example of some data that we've generated where um, the effects of a benzodiazepine and an antipsychotic, uh, the two lines below show that there is a very small effect, if any, on reaction time. 
Um, but when taken together, you see a, a deterioration in reaction time that's equivalent to being over the legal drinking uh, alcohol uh, level for driving. And so this combination has a synergistic effect that wouldn't necessarily be predicted by the uh, effects of either, either drug alone. Again, a very serious cognitive effect that can have effect on, obviously, the safety of, of, uh, of uh, the individual as well as uh, others who, who may be um, uh, in a car when they're driving uh, under these medications. So um, now to switch gears a little bit, those are some examples of you know, cognitive impairments that were maybe unanticipated either because of uh, not being a, a CNS drug or um, being uh, the result of a drug-drug combination. Um, how do we go about measuring this? Um, what's the ideal set of characteristics for a, a cognitive assessment? So we have tests that can capture and se separate each one of these cognitive functions and, and measure that. Um, these, as I mentioned, these also translate directly to neuro, uh, the neurocircuitry that, that is known in the neurochemical systems, and we can monitor that with uh, functional brain imaging. Um, these tests need to have good psych psychometric properties, um, test, retest reliability, uh, validity, and um, avoid floor and ceiling effects based on an appropriate uh, difficulty level for the population being te tested. Um, they need to be sensitive and be able to detect uh, known drug effects. Um, so uh, you, you need to be able to include a positive control in a study when you're uh, that, that, that shows that your, your particular study is sensitive to uh, drug effects. Um, it's nice if these, uh, these tests have a long history of experience in um, the scientific and clinical community, and importantly, from that experience comes a, a large set of normative data that you can use to uh, compare the effects that you're seeing um, in your own study. So these, these uh, types of tests now are uh, easily available on touch screens, uh, on iPads and, and iPhones and, uh, and other uh, such devices. These have the advantage of being able to um, measure very, very uh, uh, short, small differences in reaction time, which is important uh, c component of any kind of uh, cognitive assessment. The scoring is automated. It's administered by the machine, so you don't need to have a qualified psychologist admin administer the test, rather just a trained rater who sets the, the, uh, the instrument up and allows the, the, the uh, subject to perform the tests. Um, you can have multiple different forms of stimuli during these tests so that you try to minimize practice effects if you're doing multiple, uh, multiple assessments over short periods of time. Um, and again, uh, these touch screens are less reliant on motor skills of, you know, going online and being able to press the right keys at the right particular time. All you have to do is point at the, the object that you're using. So they're intuitive, there's operational advantages, um, and importantly, the, the data that you get from these types of things are also uh, CFR Part 11 compliant. Um, a few methodological considerations. Uh, when you're doing a cognitive test, you want to look at baseline and then measure uh, at regular intervals post-treatment. As I, I kind of uh, alluded to, you really want to include a positive control, something that it has a known cognitive uh, effect or impairment, or a competitor drug, so that you enable a comparison so that you show that your study is sensitive to pharmacological manipulation. Um, and also that you uh, now are in a position to have data that you can use for decision making. Again, depending on the comparator that you're using, you have an opportunity to uh, differentiate yourself against a competitor or a related mechanism. And depending on what the aims of the study are, are you can use sort of a design that is using a superiority uh, comparison or a non-inferiority study, depending on how big the sample size and the aims of the study. But we would also make the point that these assessments should be, you know, considered for uh, all stages of clinical development, phase one through four. And that's because you want to uh, fully understand the mechanism of action of your drug, uh, capture potential off-target effects. You want to see the effect of your drug not only in healthy normal volunteers, but also in target patient populations, uh, people that 
uh, have comorbid indications and also are uh, taking concomitant drug uh, uh, treatments. Um, and you also would like to see if there's a, a cognitive effect after chronic exposure uh, to your drug. So this suggests that you know, um, cognitive assessment um, to be really effective and to fully characterize your drug should be a part of your drug development uh, strategy uh, in all phases of development. So when we think about what's coming in the future and what's happening now, uh, I think we'll be having um, more and more uh, drugs that will have companion diagnostics. So for example, something that a, a drug that might be under consideration for Alzheimer's disease or prevention of conversion of mild cognitive impairment in order to detect uh, those patients and, and verify that they have a complaint uh, that is truly uh, prodromal Alzheimer's. You can have a sensitive cognitive test to identify those patients. Um, you can also uh, use these kinds of tests to show that for an individual taking this medication, it's actually working for that individual and you're not relying on a big data set that says in studies with a thousand people we had a two point difference on average. Um, that is fairly meaningless to a patient, but does this drug work for me? Am I, am I getting the, the benefit uh, risk that is advertised? I think in the future we'll also have cognitive test batteries that are used in combination with other uh, biomarkers and genetic markers in imaging in order to uh, choose appropriate drug therapies and uh, alone or in combination. And in addition, we will be uh, monitoring cog cognition along with other vital signs uh, using wearables and uh, um, sort of having a real-time monitoring of, of these data. Um, so coming from the past, there was a lack of awareness of cognition, self-reporting, case reports, insensitive tools, and significant unreported of, uh, unreport, under-reporting of cognitive uh, safety issues. We now have a growing awareness in the industry and by regulators. We have assessment tools that are sensitive and easy to operationalize. Uh, they're being used in all phases of drug development, and it's becoming part of a more routine part of safety tolerability profiles. Um, in the future, companion diagnostics, personalized medicine, and, and real-time monitoring. Um, and I, at, I'd just like to mention that um, these are the tests that I'm most familiar with. Our company offers some products that uh, are appropriate for use. The profile product in, in a phase one uh, situation, uh, profile two plus for uh, clinical trial uh, uh, assessments um, from phase two to four. And we also have uh, an iPad assessments that can be used to detect abuse liability uh, potential. Uh, all of these are, uh, again, connected to the cloud, instant um, scoring, and uh, continuously monitored. And we have a booth that people can come and learn more about these products at the end. So I'd like to acknowledge the people that have contributed to our thinking and our discussion about this, uh, the science team at Cambridge Cognition.